This podcast contains strong adult content, probably crude language, and general fuckery. So put those kids away. <laughs> Get them out of here. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortion. Okay. Huge increases in sexually transmitted diseases. Transgender rights is a fundamental human right. There is a right to marriage equality. I repeat, speaking to you from the steps of the Supreme Court, there is a right to marriage equality. Should sex education be taught to our kids? Rolling back contraceptive coverage for women. To make sure that women get the health care that they need. So we've got a lot of work in front of us. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, this is Frisky History, where podcasts explores the humorous, bizarre, and sometimes horrifying history of reproductive health, relationships, and sex. I am Lacey. I am Robin. And we are joined today with some very special guests. Lisa Rosenberg. Rosenberger. Give it up. <laughs> I knew I was going to do this. <laughs> I barely know her. <laughs> She Lisa, just walked and I found her on the corner. I just found her on the street. Lisa Rosenberger. How you doing? <laughs> You're still okay with doing this? Do you want to leave? No, just... <laughs> you invite me in and you kick me out. I can't do anything. Listen, oh. it's fine. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Lisa. I'm so excited you're here. Um, Lisa is a wonderful editor, a strong, independent woman, and just a beautiful person inside and out. No, that's true. Yeah, that's all those true. things are accurate. Yep. <laughs> and we, but we, that's not all. But wait, there's that's more. Not, but wait. <laughs> we also have Julie Dietz in the house. That's right. <laughs> Julie is also a wonderful editor and technical writer. Oh. And any other things you like to throw in there? Uh, cat lover. Cat, cat owner. owner. Lover? I mean, you are. I mean, I guess. Of I think you are. She's I lover. love a lot people. of people. I think you are. Yeah, yeah. you are. Some people. Eye Some surgery people. survivor. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> she is. She Partial. Yeah. She's Partial. happened in there. <laughs> so far, it's going uh, well. Yeah. I'm so happy you guys are here. Yes. Uh, listen, I don't know how this is going to sound because we are all gathered around a shitty coffee table with one tiny mic <laughs> but we're gonna do it <laughs> and i'm so work. excited are you all feeling well so, so well. good absolutely <laughs> excellent <laughs> <laughs> so listen um i'm just gonna jump right into this because i somehow managed in like eight maybe nine hours to get like nine pages mm-hmm. of stuff so i'm just gonna get in there so today we're going to be talking about a wonderful lady by the name of Estelle Naomi Trebert motherfucking Griswold. I don't know if you guys know her, but she's 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 a gem. So uh, Estelle was a civil rights activist, a feminist. She served as the executive director of Planned Parenthood in New Haven. I'm not done. There's so much more. She opened a birth control clinic um, with a Yale professor and gynecologist named Charles Lee Buxton in an attempt to change the Connecticut law banning contraception, which Mm. is the main theme of tonight's episode. That's right. This is a continuation of the last episode that we did on the Comstock Act or Comstock laws. I filled you two in briefly Mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. It was fucked up. Let's just let's just get it out there. But tonight we have some really nice stuff, and I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so Estelle was also known for setting the precedent of the right to privacy, and she was basically just an all-around badass bitch, and she went by Stell. Isn't that cool? Oh, yeah. 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 And I just want to tell you about her whole life, because <laughs> it makes me want to be her. Um, so academically, she was able to skip the fourth and seventh grade, but she ended up staying in high school for five years um, instead of four because she had a habit of ditching and encouraging other students, especially <laughs> boys, to skip school too. Yo, listen, <laughs> stay in school, but also <laughs> don't. But also, yeah, but also like honestly, it's not really gonna matter. That when you're older. No. It's true. It's a lie. Just fucking have fun. Yeah. Fun. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, man. Fuck school. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I actually no. really like education. Is so I important. really like education. High school, though, meh. Take it or leave it. That's all I'm saying. 
Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in 1922, I'm not sure how old she was because I did not look that up. Uh, she was the right age. Yeah, she was the perfect age after high school. In 1922, anywhere between the ages of 18 and a half to 65, who knows? <laughs> No. <laughs> Why would you? I'm supposed to prepare. Um, so in 1922, um, she, with her parents' disapproval, moved to France to become a singer. <gasps> I thought you, especially Robin, would like that yeah. because you. Are you a singer? Yeah. Don't you know Margarita Dog? She is. No, that she was is. in an acapella group in college. No. <laughs> so you could say I'm a singer. She is. Basically. I will say you're a singer. Yeah. Absolutely. I actually, <laughs> actually also I wrote something that <laughs> sorry this is gonna be out of control it is you guys made me laugh so much it's hard to talk <laughs> <laughs> she had a very impressive contralto contralto you don't know that singing voice I don't know I wrote it down because I thought you may know what it was oh <laughs> I don't know contralto. we'll cut this part out <laughs> <laughs> edit moving on <laughs> So, while traveling France, Stella contracted tuberculosis, um, and so, you know, infectious lung diseases, as they do, kind of um, limited her abilities to pursue that career, but she did anyways, because that's Whoa. just, like, classic Stella, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, so, she actually traveled France, and then even when she returned to New York later, because of her parents, um, they got ill and both passed away, uh, she continued to work as a singer, and she worked as a radio singer for broadcasts like NBC Red Network. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that is. Cause Sounds important. Yeah. The internet kind of, it was a whole thing with radio. So mm. it just doesn't even, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're professionals here. <laughs> it was cool. Yeah. It was cool. Uh, it's cool that she didn't even fucking worry about tuberculosis. She was like, <laughs> Fuck that noise. Yeah, exactly. Um, singing anyways. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so in 1927, she married, and this is just like, just such Stell style, Aww. a man named Richard Dick Griswold. Yay! <laughs> Richard Dick? Yeah. Well, no, his name is Richard. They called him Dick. Oh, uh, okay. Dick, I'm sorry. I did say that like Double it was a bit. Like, 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 Dick Dick Griswold. <laughs> Double D. It does give double D's new meaning. God, does, that would have been sure. so much cooler yeah. if they had been that. People, Someone write it down that. for your next child. <laughs> yeah, right. Richard no. Tick. <laughs> Insert your last name. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> I'm just at the very beginning. I gotta get it together. Uh, no, I love it. So then he just went by Dick, though. It wasn't his middle name. I didn't. You can't see the quotations on my page. They would have helped. Yeah, it should have done their quotes. I should have for, for the all the listeners, listeners at home. <laughs> right, my air quotes. Um, so a few years later, they moved from Connecticut to Washington D.C., um, where Estelle decided to end her singing career to study medicine. No um, big deal. Well, just I was sad, that. but now I'm not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like there's days when I'm like, oh, I sh- maybe I should do something else. And then I'm like, I don't know. I already That's did the lot. college stuff. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I kind of did it. And yeah. I don't want to learn stuff. That feels like a lot of work, doesn't it? it? Yeah. So, I know. It's very windy. Guys. <laughs> it's, it's, it's frightening. <laughs> uh, sorry. So... Estelle. So Estelle, she after she decided to study medicine, though, she then just became the medical instructor at the university she was attending because they were like, "You're just too good at this." So can you teach other people how to do it? Wow. I don't. I, I don't even know if she finished her degree necessarily. <laughs> she might have just walked in and they were like, "You look like you have this stuff." Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> teach us. <laughs> teach us your way, Estelle. Oh. But there's so much more. I'm not even gotten to the main I'm part. So You're still on the first. Page. I'm. Sh- I'm on the second page. Oh, technically, sorry. Because I double space. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A little behind the scenes. I, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Julie. There's no pages. No, you know no what? Pages. I didn't put page numbers in my footers, which oh. Lisa is. Oh. I know. This is the fun of doing this podcast with writers and editors. It's just like, yay, look at all the mistakes I made. Possibly and watching. Sure. I know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so much pressure. I don't even have to read well. No. We don't do that. 
don't write. Right. Right. Your reading's read. not really part no, of the job. It's not. And then the words down. <laughs> um, so at the beginning <laughs> of World War II, Dick joined the Office of Political Affairs in the State Department, and he was sent abroad to Europe. And Stella decided to join him, and then she immediately became involved in huma- humanitarian efforts like aiding refugees from Eastern European countries. But she wasn't quite satisfied with that. She decided she wanted to work at the um, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency, but they were like, no thanks. Um, so she was like, oh, okay, said no. You're <laughs> This is pretty much verbatim. This is how this whole conversation went. <laughs> but she actually did totally bypass the initial employment offices, and she went to the top of the organization and got a job. Oh, my like, god! She just worked there anyways. She was like, excuse Damn. me, do you say no? I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> the most interesting man in the world. That was still. I love her. Amazing. I love her. Yes. She's so amazing. She just doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. Okay. So, while she was working for the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency, um, the, the main thing she did was help refugees um, resettle in places like Rio de Janeiro and Puerto Rico. And while she was doing all this, she witnessed uh, just so much poverty and starvation and really realized that the cause of it um, was overpopulation. And the cause of that was due to a lack of access to birth control. So she became very passionate about um, fighting for women's rights to have access to birth control so that they could protect themselves. Um, Because really, when it came to where, where she was and the things that she was seeing at the time, their only options were to... I just kind of, I don't even know if I wrote this out, but it's gross. Um, Give in to their husbands and deal with unwanted pregnancies or refuse them and suffer often abusive consequences. So um, that sucks. I know I said this was happy, but it gets there. Uh, Yeah, we'll get there. (laughs) We'll get there. Ups and downs. Um, Yeah. So... After working there for a little while, Stell and Dick both returned to the U.S. in 1950, and they decided to live in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, and Stell just kept kind of driving uh, her passion for helping women. She volunteered as the executive secretary to the Human Relations Council, and she did that totally for free. She didn't even care. <laughs> then she helped fund infertility programs and marriage counseling um, programs at Yale. And uh, her roles in these programs were very much inspired by what she experienced abroad, but also she had a lot of empathy towards couples who couldn't have children because she also could not have children. Uh, So she was a very empathetic person. And she also happened to live right next to a Planned Parenthood, (laughs) (laughs) which is just so convenient. Um, And she got to know a lot of the people while she was there. Uh, And... The Planned Parenthood at the time and honestly kind of all the way back to like the early 1900s, they had been really working to push new legislation that challenged Connecticut's laws that banned the use of contraceptive. And um, so I want to be clear that like even the things that uh, I'll talk about, it's not like... Estelle did all of them by herself. She didn't even necessarily start them um, because Planned Parenthood worked for so long, starting with even uh, Margaret Sanger, their founder in 1914, with just trying to get women access to healthcare and birth control, especially. So um, the first Planned Parenthood opened in Connecticut in 1935, but uh, since 1914 and 1935 and all this time up until, you know, the 1950s when Estelle was living next door, they were facing tons of opposition from conservative organizations who could have guessed um, about what they were trying to do. And so they, I feel like I'm talking so fast. You guys have thoughts? (laughs) (laughs) Not Dude. one thought. Not single one. I don't do that much these days. <laughs> no, it's a really, I, it's a really riveting story. She's so interesting. Um, and it's so funny, though. Like, so I'm getting to the point where she really becomes a part of Planned Parenthood. Okay. And they... What happened is, because Planned Parenthood was facing so much opposition, they were having a really hard time getting things through at all. They really... They wanted to commit to, like, a person to be their figurehead, mm-hmm. and they wanted that person to be um, 
kind of chill and not like a radical liberal that of course we're immediately going to be like you're just with your beliefs and yeah. you're just a hippie I don't know what they call it radical liberals <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like everyone calls hippies, people they don't yeah. like hippies so. <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't know but I feel like they expected a certain kind of person mm-hmm. um, and Planned Parenthood was smart enough to be like we need to send in someone that they can't they can't say anything against that person's background or behavior or thoughts in general and that helps us get our message in front of who that person is instead mm-hmm. of having them take all the spotlight um and so i lost my place there we go um estelle got involved with them even though she lived next door and kind of knew them she just kind of had this chance encounter with the woman who was the assistant to the soon to be retired planned parenthood executive director um and that woman whose name is jenny kind of jokingly offered to sell the job but also kind of wasn't joking Mm -hmm. and at first uh Still wasn't real sure. She was like, oh, I don't know, maybe. Again, for brain. Like her. Well, <sighs> I'm not sure if I'm not really sure why she she had to think about it for a little while, and um, she she saw the importance of having contraceptive, but I don't think she had a a large medical background, especially in the way of birth control. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I actually read that she didn't even know what a diaphragm was whenever she had the interview with the like Planned Parenthood president of the Connecticut chapter. So she didn't even really know how it was, which I guess makes sense if you, um, maybe if she couldn't have children she didn't really have a need for birth control Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe she just never had to use it and access getting access to it anyway is really hard Mm -hmm. so uh, I think that was really the point is that she just didn't really feel confident that she would be able to do the job well Hmm. but then uh, she accepted it in 1953 I'm sure not after that long because she really needed money (laughs) 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 yeah Yeah, her husband got uh, sick and I yeah. don't think he could work as much. I think he had like emphysema or something. Um, and yeah, poor yeah. Dick. I hate Dog. when that happens. <laughs> poor Dick. <laughs> so um, on January 1st, 1954, uh, Estelle began her work as the executive director of Planned Parenthood League of Connecticut. And uh, while she worked there at first, she did things like border uh, organizing border runs, which is where they would um, get women on a bus and take them to New York or Rhode Island, where they were able to get some like proper birth control methods that they needed outside of Connecticut. They couldn't get them in Connecticut, sorry. Um, And then, most importantly, she decided to join the movement that Planned Parenthood had kind of been pushing for all this time to abolish birth control laws. A little bit about what was happening with contraceptives at the time. In 1960, the FDA approved the pill as a contraceptive, but states in but states like Connecticut, and there were a couple more. I think Connecticut was one of the very last ones to really um, have this law and keep enforcing it. Enforcing it. Um, it wasn't actually illegal for doctors to prescribe birth control. And um, obviously, Stell wasn't the only person doing this fight because since that happened, when the FD- FDA did approve the birth control pill, a lot of women health supporters across the country spent decades trying to make birth control more accessible and more affordable and 2017 <laughs> still totally happening because yeah. <laughs> we don't change uh, in America. So just a call back to last episode. Um, the reason why birth control in Connecticut was still illegal uh, stemmed from the Comstock Act uh, that kept and the Comstock Act kept the contraceptives and anything really related to what they would have seen as obscene material. It kept it out of the mail, which meant it couldn't pass state lines. It really couldn't travel too far from city to city. Um, But that wasn't enough to keep the people within the same place from trading information about it, from doctors giving it to, to patients who came into their office. So Connecticut had its own state law that just banned the sale um, and manufacturing of contraceptive altogether. Uh, And it had been upheld since it was enacted in 1879. And it is now 1953. Mm. 1960, because, yeah, it was still there in 1960 as well. So for 75 years before Estelle even came in to fight, uh, 
women in Connecticut just did not have access to anything. And I I actually have what the law said, and it's a lot um, of words, but I'll read it to you. <laughs> the 1879 law provided that any person who uses any drug, medical, article, or instrument for the purposes of preventing contraception shall be fined no less than $40 or imprisoned no less than 60 days. Um, also, it went on to say that any person who assists, abets, counsels, causes, hires, or commands another to commit any offense may be prosecuted and punished as if he were the principal offender. So, didn't leave a lot of room for doctors to do wow. their job. <laughs> um, and it's really interesting. I found uh, one way that women... In the 1960s, when the pill was FDA approved, one of the ways that single women tried to get birth control is that they would try to find what they considered to be an enlightened doctor who would prescribe birth control to women if they were engaged, and then they would just buy a ring and share it. Like, a whole college (laughs) girls would just pass around one ring, and there was, like, a quote in one of them where the doctor was like, if I saw that ring one time, I saw it 27 times. (laughs) So I think the doctors knew what was going on That's but luckily so i God. think they, they were, were kind of cool. cool about it yeah, yeah. yeah. you know d- doctors know things we should listen to them it's great it's important yeah. <laughs> um, and then this is really where uh Stell's journey to the supreme court began uh so it started on just obviously as the law works order of operations on a state level <laughs> you can't just like straight up just walk into the supreme court and be like you're my <laughs> case <laughs> Um, so at first, she and doc- Dr. Charles Buxton, who I brought up in the beginning, the Yale professor and gynecologist, mm-hmm. um, he worked with her to fight the 1879 law um, in a case that was known as Poe versus Ullman. And I'm just going to give you like a brief background on this case because there's a whole other case after it. Um, but it involved a married couple who went by the aliases of Paul and Pauline Poe, which is cute. Beautiful. <laughs> so cute. Yeah, Straight up, like, right out of a comic book. I love it. Aww. Alliteration's fun. Let's all do it. <laughs> um, and they had given birth to three children, but all of them died of medical com- complications shortly after. Aww. And then another woman was a part of this case as well. And she just went by Jane Doe. But she experienced paralysis and speech impediment after almost dying in childbirth. So, uh, Stell and Buxton wanted to just fight for their right to get contraceptive that was needed to prevent any further physical or mental deterioration that would happen if they were to have children again. So, it's like a fucking life or death situation. Um... But, you know, the state courts decided to uphold the statue in a 5-4 to four ruling on, Janu- on June 20th, 1961. Uh, yeah. Based on what did they have? Oh, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> I will tell okay. you. Okay, that's <laughs> fucking stupid. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. <sighs> so, their reasoning uh, to uphold this Connecticut law is that it had never been enforced and the consequences of its violation was not harmful. <gasps> oh my really? god. Yeah, so they're like, if we don't even go by it, why would we get rid of it? <laughs> Which makes all the sense, doesn't it? So much sense. Yeah, doesn't it? And coincidentally, right before the court decision was made, a Connecticut man was arrested and fined for providing, for, for providing condoms at a gas station. Ugh. He was reported by multiple people <laughs> to the police oh for having God. condoms that he wanted to sell in his gas station. Oh, he sold them. I was like, is this guy just, just has <laughs> condoms? <laughs> That's true. I would call the cops on that. Yeah. <laughs> that would be That's a fair. fair. I mean, I appreciate the gesture, but weird. That's weird. totally fair. <laughs> I could have been more clear. He was trying to okay. sell them okay. on the gas station. <laughs> Nothing weird here. <laughs> um, so, I don't think anything really bad happened to him. He was arrested, maybe fined a little, but it was not a ton, too much, obviously, to just be trying to provide condoms to people. Um, So, to combat this loss in the state court, Stell decided that she was going to purposely open a birth control clinic clinic as an experiment to test the state's ban on contraceptive. So, she was basically (laughs) like, Oh, you saying that you're like, you don't use this school. I'll just open a birth control clinic then. What are you going to do about it? (laughs) 
So she got a small building. She hired qualified, <laughs> real, like, safe doctors who were willing to advise women. And the clinic opened in about three months after that ruling. Wow. So cool. Yeah. Immediately, she was met with controversy and protesters. <laughs> yeah. Who were like, this is not right. <laughs> Jesus. You need Jesus. <laughs> um, I Just can only Jesus imagine. Just, God, you need Jesus. Uh, so within days of opening that clinic, detectives arrived to inspect the practice, and Stell was like, sure thing, come on in. And yeah. she, like, it so fucking enthusiastically gave them a grand tour and gave them specific details about everything because she, wa- you know basically was trying to get arrested. She actually informed them that um, as they were leaving the clinic that she was totally fine with being arrested, but she would not be fingerprint printed or photographed. <laughs> um, two yeah. days later, she was arrested. Oh. Her and Burkson were both arrested, um, but they didn't fucking fingerprint her or <laughs> photograph her. Wow. Yeah, because she's a badass bitch and do what Stell says. That's fucking yeah. Right. yeah. Do it Stel- on her turn. Mm-hmm. Damn. Damn it. Yeah, when Stell tells you something, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't. In this or case. you don't. <laughs> um, so this arrest pretty much opened the door for her and her team to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they accepted the case, God, which is I good. It. I know. Thank you. She's like, wow. it's all going according to plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the best we can do in this yeah, country right? sometimes. God damn. Uh, so they went in with their like guns figuratively blazing and um, they wanted to prove that the Connecticut stat- the Connecticut statue just kind of just straight up violated the constitution basically um, and they went in with specifically stating the 14th amendment which reads and this is going to sound supernatural because you know when they were written and all <laughs> no hashtags uh, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person the equal protection of the laws. Um, so basically, what she was trying to get out of it is that the Constitution, um, they, they had a constitutional right to privacy regarding reproductive decisions, and that the state's laws infringed her personal freedoms that she was guaranteed as an American citizen. So this is very much based on privacy. Uh, it's kind of being able to find like a legal loophole that allows you go to go in because you obviously you can't just be like this is stupid <laughs> this is just dumb that's why we should stop doing it <laughs> um and the constitution doesn't explicitly protect general right to privacy but um the very i don't know the various guarantees within the bill of rights creates <laughs> And numerous, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to say it. It means zones that establish a right to privacy. Um, and I think with the justices and the lawyers, they actually came out and they went beyond the 14th Amendment and, and said that it was the first third for my dog is snoring. <laughs> 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 he snores like a grown person. I know. <laughs> Really killing my vibe though. He's, he's into it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Clearly, he cares. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking men. Um, <laughs> So, uh, they found that the first, third, fourth, and ninth amendment um, together kind of created this new constitutional right and the right to privacy in marital relations. I looked up what all these amendments meant. Uh, they basically all just, I mean, obviously I know what the first amendment means. That one's kind of easy. Um, the third one, I don't get much at all because it doesn't make much sense. It's talking about soldiers and private homes. But I think the whole point of it is they all talk about your right to privacy and then the fourth amendment no the ninth amendment um kind of just says that you have rights even if they're not specifically written down in the constitution so like it may not say you can pee in your own bathroom but you can pee in your own bathroom that's Uh, allowed it doesn't have to say it so i know this whole time don't worry guys (laughs) you have the right to urinate almost wherever you want 
Not Almost. in public. <laughs> we haven't gotten that far. <laughs> um, and luckily, most of the justices agreed with them. So on June 7th, 1965, by a 7-2 to two majority, the Supreme Court concluded that the Connecticut statue was unconstitutional and that a state had no right to ban contraception for married couples. Unfortunately, only married couples at this mm-hmm. moment. Um, and in doing so, it violated the right to marital privacy. Uh, so basically what the court, what this was kind of showing the world is that the Supreme Court believed that people should be free from any unnecessary interference um, of the state. And they considered that the very idea of, and this is kind of a quote, of searching marital bedrooms for contraceptions is repulsive to the notion of privacy surrounding a marriage relationship. Marriage relationship. <laughs> I like how you say that. Um, <laughs> big piece of paper I put together. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so at the time, this only applied to people who were married, um, and it would take, like, seven more years before single people were allowed full access to birth control on totally the same reason. Like, they got it's the exact same thing, right to privacy, they did all the same things, but for <laughs> some reason, it took seven more years. Yeah. Uh, so those girls must have really worn the shit out of that engagement ring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is just kind of some background on what it was like at the time that the Griswold decision happened. Um, 32 women were dying for every 100,000 live births that happened in America. Uh, today, the rate of that is less than half of that. Not like oh. it's less than half of 32 women for every 100,000. Right. Um, infant mortality also fell even faster. Uh, from then to today, it went from 25 deaths to six deaths per 1,000 live births. Okay. <laughs> so weird. Some of these words paired together. Are so weird. <laughs> um, so of course, giving women access to birth control helped them lead healthier lives across the board. Uh, they were able to now invest in their futures and their careers, be cool, fuck kids. No, I'm just kidding. They could what? choose when they want to. Oh, wait, not fuck you. Oh, like, fuck kids. <laughs> Julie! Oh, wait, excuse me. God! I Julie, am not, I am I not a part you. of this. Oh, really? Listen, you're just like, no, there's a I guy outside the gas station you know. giving money, <laughs> throwing condoms at so you. you can fuck kids. <laughs> you can fuck kids. Oh, no. Julie. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I meant that. Uh, no, I was trying to word it. Okay. <laughs> Ryan wasn't even going to say anything. Yeah. I was like, huh, where's she going with it? <laughs> was just like, I'm just going to let it roll. <laughs> I'm not even going to bring it up. <laughs> God. Are you allowed to have privacy? No. This, this is what I'm getting at. Yeah. <laughs> it's a free country, except that's not okay. It's that's not okay. Not okay. Don't. Um, don't. We're not. Don't say do we're this. cool with that. We're not. We're okay. hard oh, against man. it. Um, I meant more along the lines <laughs> of you didn't have to have kids. God. Fuck the notion of yes. having kids when you're not ready. Beautifully I said. Yeah, I, said that I could have done that better. Really Let's just edit. start over. <laughs> From the top. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking fire, Ron. God damn. I'm killing it. Shit. No, but okay. <clears throat> so now they could invest in their futures and they could plan their families when they well fucking wanted to. <laughs> um, and Stell's personal role in this uh, was extremely vital. Um, and it's really helped start a women's rights revolution. Uh, the Griswold v. Connecticut case was landmark. Uh, was a landmark case that paved the way for legislation for birth control for unmarried couples, which we talked about seven years later. <laughs> Seems like so long. And why? Yeah. Does it matter? I mean, it's a piece of paper. Mm. Um, Just why does it, why is it about the, the privacy and not about the actual, like, health of mm-hmm, women? Mm-hmm. Slow down, Julie. Yeah, wow. Uh, <laughs> you right. the Constitution. Oh. Uh, yeah. I mean, so, if, right? So, if we're, if, if we're, I mean, she was brilliant. She was brilliant to 
to, to be able to take it to the Supreme Court really mm-hmm. that quickly based on the Constitution. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is still that it was still a bunch of old white men. Mm-hmm. The Constitution. So, yeah, if she went in there and she was like, don't you care about women's health and futures? They would have been like, and let's just go and decide on this now, right? Zero right. <laughs> seven all around. Yeah. That's where we want to stand, right? <laughs> so sad. Isn't it? Totally. Yeah. And also, like, I don't even feel like our conversation has gotten there in 2017. No. Yeah. Who cares nope. about women's health? Ugh. Mm. Right? Ugh. But also, ultimately, um, Griswold v. Connecticut uh, also helped Roe v. Wade, which was the case that uh, legalized safe legal abortion. Legalized safe abortion. <laughs> Guys, I'm oh. almost done. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking forever. Everyone no. around this coffee table completely followed. <laughs> <laughs> you guys all oh, get it. Even, even I know, even my dad stopped snoring for that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he respects it. <laughs> um, uh, five years after Griswold v. Connecticut, um, college enrollments were 20% higher among women who got the pill by age 18. <gasps> no. Dude, get those goddamn educations. I know earlier we were talking about <laughs> Yeah, but it is. High school and college. Is higher higher education. Yeah, yeah. Get through high school yeah. so you can get to college and then you pay attention. Right. Don't yeah. skip class with boys. 20% or girls. is huge. <laughs> yeah. And that was only five years after. That's not today. That's who knows what it is today. Actually, I do know that today women are the majority of undergrad students in America. Yay. That's so lovely. That's right. Um, Also, salary increases happen. So one third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s are a result of access to oral contraceptives. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's good for the economy. Look at this. Someone should tell the, the white dudes that. Let them know. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Uh, without these family planning services today, um, probably then too, the number of unintended pregnancies and abortions would be nearly two thirds higher. So just so you know, in case you want to know why we need birth control. Yeah. One, it's none of your goddamn business. Yeah. Two, End go away. <laughs> See number one. <laughs> yeah, See <laughs> number one. <laughs> Fuck out of my medicine cabinet, please. <laughs> um, I actually have a really nice quote that is from someone that I don't know, but I thought it was pretty. <laughs> uh, her name is Letty uh, Cotton. Pogreven? I don't know. No. Uh, co- could be that. Could Cotton be something. Cope. Cotton Pogreven. Her name is just like Letty Gripper Gripper. That's her whole name. She was. I know. Po- yeah. You've heard of her. Yeah. We yes. Know. She, we <laughs> she was a co-founding Lisa editor. I know. <laughs> We're the country bumpkins. We know it. <laughs> Sorry, it's so quaint. Inside joke. Inside. It's so quaint. Mm-hmm. It's so quaint. beautiful. She was a co-founding editor of Miss Magazine. Never read it. Oh, sure. I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've never you read You subscriber? It. Yep. <laughs> Every day. Right? I get that magazine. Ms. Oh, right. It's M-S. the MS M-S. one. Yeah. How do you pronounce that one? <laughs> I don't know. Ms. 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 That's the one. Uh, this is what she said. It's really nice. Um, for the few times... <laughs> <laughs> really, I was just asking because I didn't know if there was a Miss Magazine and a Ms. Magazine. No, so I, I was. Uh, it's the MS one. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still unclear what the answer to that is, Lisa. I don't know which one of those it is. Ms. <laughs> I love that. I love that title though. It sounds so bitchy. That's why, yeah, like Ms. Yeah. So, it like sounds so much better if I'm yeah. fucking married or I'm not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Figure it out yourself. It sounds like better than Miss. I just like to go by like, uh, excuse me, you're young. person. Miss is wonderful in your own. Oh, I will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna try this. Ma'am sucks. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, sorry, no, no, sorry, no, sorry, no. Sorry, it's sorry, fine. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try to do it right this time. You got it. Res- pay respect to her beautiful words. <laughs> For the first time in human history, a woman could control her sexuality and determine her readiness for reproduction by swallowing a pill smaller than an aspirin. Critics warned that the pill would spawn generations of loose immoral women. What's up? Ah! <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, what it spawned was generations of empowered women who are better equipped to make rational choices about their lives. Suck on that. 
end quote. Comstock. <laughs> fucking yeah. Tony Comstock rolling Tony. over in his grave. Good. <laughs> fucking hate yeah. that guy. Sucks. Um, right. Uh, oh my god, I'm done. What? Shit. That went so fast. Bye. That's it. <laughs> that is the case of Griswold v. Connecticut and oh. how married people were able to get access to birth control legally in the state of Connecticut. That is amazing. That was a beautiful story. Ooh, yeah, she, really I love that. her. She's really great. inspiring. I'm happy about Planned Parenthood. <sighs> yeah. Well, and th- I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to nerd it out, but I mean, no nerd. That, all over us. That <laughs> decision, seven to two. I mean, that's. I mean, mm-hmm. that had a lot. Of, she was so smart. Yeah. She and Charlie. Charles Buxton. Yeah, Charlie. She and Charlie, yeah, Charlie. were so Char- Char- mm-hmm. really smart. Yes. And how they did that because mm-hmm. they figured out like. Like even though even though I agree it should have been about women's health. It should they have knew been about no that. Actually but they cared. knew how they knew how to work mm-hmm. they knew how to work the system and mm-hmm. they knew the constitution. It's true. Much better than I do. Yeah, yeah. I had to Google yeah. like three out of the four of those <laughs> <It's exhausting. laughs> amendments. Like the soldier one? What the Yeah, I don't know. You wanna read it for you? Yeah. Backwards? Okay. I'm kinda of scared about that. Let me just find it in my yeah. papers. Um <laughs> God, there's a lot of papers. I didn't realize how much I've... Start. Okay, so the Third Amendment places restrictions on the quartering of soldiers in private homes without the owner's consent, forbidding the practice in peacetime. So it basically was saying in a time of peace, you can't uh, quarter a soldier in a private home without the owner's consent. Oh, so the soldier can't be like, hey, Lacey, your couch looks great. I'm going <laughs> to crash on it yeah. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Based on cats, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what it's saying. Right? <laughs> I don't, I have no idea. Listen, this is the one I understand. Freedom of speech and right to a peaceful assembly. I'm like, got it. Yes. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. The Although other- <laughs> some people in, some people in positions of authority today don't quite get I'm not sure what you're that. talking about, Lisa. <laughs> I can't imagine. You don't have to be more Who is specific. it that you're speaking of? I don't know, but it was a huge crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh day. God! It was the biggest, the bigliest crowd, the oh. <laughs> crowd. <laughs> this is why we need more women like Cell and all the lovely people of Planned Parenthood. Can't yeah. talk about them enough. I agree. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I need to go there. Actually, it's about yeah. that time. Yeah, I'm just gonna go now. So it's been fun, so, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Go. Thank you. Get my female checkup real fast. <laughs> uh, God. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Really well done. Um, I can read more amendments to you if you'd like, but other than that, that's all I got. Yeah. That's the story of Estelle Griswold. No, she yeah. kicked ass. Yeah, dude. She got arrested. God, I want to get arrested so bad. But not for anything <laughs> serious. <laughs> I, I want to get arrested for something real stupid. Not I like feel stupid like bad. You stupid, like you could. Like I want to like accidentally flick off a cop and then he arrests me and I get out like 30 minutes later with no charges. <laughs> well, that actually hasn't, hasn't that just happened? Did, Did that somebody happen flip off Trump? Oh, somebody yeah. Flip oh, off yeah. Trump? oh yeah. Oh, she, she lost, lost her job. job. That's she fucked did. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was right. under yeah, that, okay, you're going a little far, Lisa. Yeah, I'm not that adventurous. <laughs> I need my job. <laughs> Stell gets it. We need money. <laughs> yeah, Stell she, does get it. That's yeah, true. Knows. Listen, I respect that she was like, I'm not sure if I want to help change the course of history. Oh, you're paying me? Sure. I respect <laughs> I'm in. Because, I mean, that's Get that money, babe. Part of the yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, seriously. For sure. Honestly, it's amazing. And then I think, like, she quit being the executive director of Planned Parenthood shortly after this because she was having all this internal drama with the people who work there. I read it briefly, but I didn't write it down. I can kind of remember. Um, So her husband was still um, alive but very, very sick, and she wanted to move into a carriage house that was attached to the Planned Parenthood office, but people um, who worked there were kind of not happy about it because they were having some financial troubles, so she convinced them anyways. Uh, She was like, I'm still going to do it, Um, but then I think it caused them too much internal tension, and she was like, I don't need this, so Mm. she left shortly after, but not before she fucked some shit up. That's right. I love her. For so all great. of us. I know. She fucks some shit up for all of us. I love her oh, yeah. for it, too. Me too. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. It's great. Wow. 
So sleep on that tonight, people. Yeah, <laughs> it's that's been real. Like, it feels so much better than our last episode. I know. <laughs> we can <laughs> talk about happy things sometimes. I'm so yeah. mad about it, but now, yeah, this is redeeming. It felt redemptive. Better. It redemplative. Re- redemplative. <laughs> Redeeming. Uh, okay. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for know. listening. Yeah, no, I really want to thank Lisa and Julie for I'm being so here. I'm so glad you guys were here. Because I think I speak for both of us when I say that, like, you guys are both people, you, you women are both people that we... <laughs> <laughs> that we look up to and respect so deeply. insanely and deeply. Mm-hmm. Deeply. It's and insane. insanely. It is insane. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... Yeah, we want to thank you guys for being here. Yeah, I'm so glad you guys sat here. Uh, I hope it was good. It was wonderful. (laughs) It was awesome. Uh, Next time, I won't have as many drinks before I have to read eight pages (laughs) so that I can talk like a normal person. (laughs) High five me. Cool. Uh, (laughs) And thank you all at home for joining us on this evening. Uh, On this evening. (laughs) God damn it. I'm, I'm turning this <laughs> you can find us on the internet at facebook instagram and twitter our handle is at frisky history um you can also listen on soundcloud stitcher itunes google maybe has one anywhere podcasts are available uh you can direct your questions concerns feedback and weird sex stories to our email at frisky at gmail.com yeah uh so bye <laughs>